boy thing. I formed a company with Mr. Kazunari Tomi, and the company's name is Studio Alex. We went to Game Arts to promote our business, and we told them we would like to make an RPG game with a compelling story that was something different from other games that existed at that time. After playing the Lunar game, if people would say, we have to live in a more positive fashion, live our lives looking to the future, that is the kind of game I wanted to make. This was the motive that inspired the Lunar game. You had this great story, these characters that you cared about, and you were interested to see how they got together at the end, Alex and Luna. It played out more like a movie than a game because of the animated sequences along the way. It kept getting the player back into the game. A large percentage of the games that come to the U.S. Uh, originate in Japan. They start in Japan and they're reworked for the U.S. audience. We were the first independent CD-ROM publisher in the U.S. So I'd heard about Lunar, 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 and I really had no preconception about what it was. I was thinking of some sort of moon game. When we saw the Sega CD version of Lunar, we knew that that was a game we wanted to do. It was a great game. They had a, a CD-ROM system that was single speed, 150K a second. You could only spool so much data off of that. So you couldn't get really involved animations. You had a limited amount of video memory, a limited color palette. There was lots of limits. Games with good stories cannot be made without CD-ROM. And because of that, Lunar started with Sega CD, then a Saturn version, and then the PlayStation version. Whenever there's a better means of expression available, we will use it to express things better. And that's why we made the PlayStation version. People might ask a question such as, which version is the authentic version, Sega CD or Sony PlayStation? Or is there any difference? But I think they both reflect the story of Lunar. I believe the Lunar world actually exists. The person who tells the story may change. Before, Mr. Sega CD tended to often forget things, and he didn't pay attention to the details of things. But nonetheless, he was the storyteller for the first Lunar. This time, Mr. PlayStation, who is more sensible, smarter, and has a better memory, with more capacity for expression, told the history of the Lunar world. The first storyteller sometimes forgot some of the characters, or told the ending in rather finalistic terms, while the new storyteller told us much more. My friend. Since the Sega CD version of Lunar to the PlayStation version of Lunar, we have rewritten the latter half completely. The biggest difference is the description of the heroine, Luna. In the Sega CD version, where the main character, Alex, leaves the island, they part. If that's the case, though, we felt that people might not feel sympathetic toward the heroine, so we changed that in the revised scenario. We also increased the number of characters in the game. The development of the enemies was a little weak, so we added some enemies. I believe there were only two or three minutes of animation for the original CD version, but now there is about an hour of animation. As for the voice actors, in the first version of Lunar there were only four actors, but now there are about 15 voice actors. In terms of imagery, there was quite a bit of upgrading, so there's almost no comparison. There's been a, quite a few changes, actually, to the scenario in Lunar. Definitely the characters are older. There's no age actually given, but they're definitely older than the first one. And I think that that was to strengthen the love aspect of it. But also, another reason they were aged, as I understand it, is because uh, the people that had played the original had aged, too. And so they wanted to keep it so they could still relate to these characters. Wokusan, his art designs are great. Huge fan of what he's actually done with the Lunar characters and what he's also done with anime, because he doesn't just do game characters. He's, he actually is involved with manga and anime. Uh, he's done some very popular stuff in Japan, like Giant Robo animation series. As for special training, I really haven't done anything such as going to a specialized animation school or learning from someone else in particular. 
全部あの Everything I learned, I learned by actually doing work. その時自分が、えーまあ、To design the costumes, I suppose I was inspired by what I saw in movies, magazines, and people around the city. For instance, the scarf Luna wears is an idea that was inspired by a nurse's outfit at the dentist I was going to at that time. This is the storyboard for the Silver Star story. There are about 45 to 46 scenes here. Once this is accepted, we start the actual animation by placing orders for the scenes to animators. For the remake of Lunar, digital paint was used instead of celluloid. The drawings were first scanned and then painted with a specialized software. And sequenced as movie clips. Once that is done, the next steps are taken. Editing, retaking, and soundtracking, just like any other animation. Computer graphics, CG, was used a lot in the scene of Luna on the boat, such as this part where the ship moves. The ocean is a regular 2D background. The ship is mostly all CG. Also, these night bugs, somewhat like lightning bugs, are done in CG. The advantage of 3D is that it is possible to create objects that are difficult to draw by hand. First, we give the layout to the 3D person. Who creates something that moves like this? We print that out as a wireframe, and we give that printout to the animator. For one scene of Luna singing, there was this much printout. We gave it to the animators, and we asked them to complete it within a week or so. But it actually took two months. The 3D CG was rendered using soft image. We combine images rendered by soft image with the images that are colored with the Macintosh. Then we do partial touch-ups. We then complete the process using QuickTime, etc. We edit the QuickTime movies using Adobe Premiere. Usually, when you are involved in a production as an animator, your involvement is very restricted. But in the case of Lunar, I was able to be involved in not only the plot, but also the scenario, and even part of the game making. In other games, most of the time it is difficult for animation staff to work so well with the game staff. With Lunar, we could both work well together, argue well with one another. The long period of time involved in this project allowed us the opportunity to exchange ideas with one another. We all gained a lot from each other. Objectively speaking, the boat song is not a scene that is directly related to the game. When our schedule was getting a bit tight, it was suggested that we cut it for that reason. By having that scene, I thought it would be possible to show Luna's spirit through a more interesting approach than those used by typical games or animated illustrations. I insisted very strongly to keep this scene, and luckily the producer and others accepted my opinion.
music makes up the world of Lunar. Um, the ma magical spells are, are cast um, based on, on the musical songs. And that's pretty much your first scene with Luna, is she is singing. So the music is a very important part of this game. I think the music is very important. There is a good chance that 70 to 80 percent of a scene's emotional impact can be attributed to the music. For example, this time we had the very talented Mr. Iwadari from the very beginning, which was very lucky, I think. The music he makes moves people's hearts. I was in charge of the music for the first Lunar, the Mega CD, Lunar the Silver Star. And since then, I have been in charge of all the music in the Lunar series. Udari does the actual music composition for uh, Lunar, a, a number of other things too, but in this particular case, he does the composition for Lunar. Uh, his company is 2-5. He works very closely with uh, Isao Mizuguchi, uh, who does the arrangement and the, uh, the lyrics and such for the songs. The scenario writers and graphics people will tell us specific places they would like to use the lyrics. I will first ask them what kind of scene that is. For example, what state of mind is the heroine in when she sings that song? In what situation does that particular song come out of her mouth? The song is the heroine's, though I write the song. For the listeners, the song is sung by the heroine naturally in that situation. Lunar the Silver Star included about 38 songs or pieces of music. And among them, a main song emerged, which was the song of the festival that Luna sang by the natural spring. This was a very important song in the game. And the image it created was one I wanted to keep. All the other songs were created according to the image of Luna that existed in my mind. These amounted to over 100 pieces of music. It took about half a year to complete it. After I made the first song, however, there was a layoff for a hiatus. But I wrote over a hundred pieces of music. So I needed about half a year. Usually when people complete an RPG game, they feel it was great. But for Lunar, because I received postcards, I know it is true. I get comments like, I cried for the first time after finishing an RPG. I look at the mail from the users of the game and at the home page, and I see descriptions of them saying something like, the tears come out when I listen to the opening song, Wings. People seem to be attracted by songs. And I hear these messages that say, when I listen to the wind nocturne, it exposes the heart bare. There are some battle songs that people seem to like that make them feel heartwarming. Things you have to isolate when you're looking at a Japanese game, uh, as far as what's its suitability for the U.S., is the language, um, because there is some stuff that's acceptable in Japanese language even that uh, you can't use in the U.S. without getting a, a stern rating. For example, in Cosmic Fantasy II, which is one of the games we did for Turbo Graphics, which is a pretty innocent game overall, there was a scene where one of the characters flipped off another one in, in a close-up. <laughs> so we had to change that to she was shaking her fist. We pretty much take the main plot points throw away the rest of it and write it in an American style. 
with a bunch of cultural references that people can relate to. Even though it's set in this mystical world, you still have these pop culture references that allow you to get an attachment to the characters. And people uh, tend to get more involved in something that they can relate to. One of the things we're known for now is the translation. Um, the, the quality translation, the, the fluid way that people speak, the natural way that people speak. If we hurry, we may be able to sneak in without waking the dragon. Then we can get a fantastically huge diamond from its lair worth thousands and thousands of silver, making us filthy, stinking rich, and very popular in the process! In our games, we always try to improve it, add some gameplay element that's, that improves the game, makes it more fun for the user, or, or easier to play. We added some personality to some of the characters, like Might's Lab, you had this guy in this, in this tower, this inventor, and he's all up in this tower, and you have to go to this huge thing to get this maze to get up there. And we're like, well, why was he so isolated? You know, he's like a hermit, a recluse. And so in the US version, which wasn't in the Japanese one, we uh, had him suffering from tremendous body odor. So that's why he had to be isolated. And so he makes comments of, of that, that ilk. You're trespassing, go away! <laughs> I'm sort of a professional hacker, right? They've already written the code, but it doesn't really work for English. They have, uh, you know, the Japanese character set has thousands, tens of thousands of characters. Whereas in English, we have a relatively small defined set of characters, but the words tend to be longer because it takes more characters to express a thought. They gave us a space of 38K to actually put all the text for a particular section of the game, and uh, the English text can get up to 72K in size. So I had to write data compression to squish that text down so it would actually fit into memory. And that's been a major battle for me. Welcome to the Magic Guild of Vain, Alex of Berg. I am Galleon. My apprentice Nash speaks quite highly of you. He said you cleared the trail for the White Dragon. Is... I didn't make it. The actors for the first one were John Truitt, uh, who's the voice of Galleon, and probably the most well-known of all of them. He said you cleared the trail of the White Dragon. Is that true? <laughs> voice from Galleon, you sort of have to rest your body into it and, and enunciate every single word clearly and just enjoy every delicious sound. I didn't realize, you know, when you see the people making, uh, making cartoons sometimes, you think they look kind of ridiculous because they've got their hands moving up and down and they're bouncing and they're jumping around. But you actually have to do that with your body in order to get the right sounds and, and the right inflections coming out of your voice. To get the right performance usually doesn't take much more than saying this is your motivation this is what's going on here you know if you're jumping or whatever you know do a little jog in place to get yourself out of breath a little bit and then do it but sometimes you have to do extreme methods and you know the favorite story of john is uh the milk the warm milk from wendy's we were filming something and i was supposed to be choking or coughing on something and we came up with this wonderful idea that uh milk would do the trick, and uh, I think that I must have downed something like a gallon and a half of milk while I'm trying to hack up all this sputum and all this phlegm and all this stuff that would make it sound perfect. Uh, I, I was a little sick after that. You come in and you kind of memorize your lines first of all, because a lot of times you have to match the video, and you have to lip sync it exactly. I mean, you've got to really, really fit uh, the voice and into the action into the allotted time that you have because the animators have done their job first and then you have to go back and you have to fit your stuff in uh, with what they've done so yeah it can be really really tough victor he's my husband's best friend and they've been buddies since high school he called me up because he needed a little cutesy voice and a little mousy voice <laughs> and that's what i have so <laughs> jackie powers does the um voice of Nall again. Um, well, it's really exciting to come in and there's a huge sound booth and um, people and cords and contraptions everywhere. It's easy and it's comfortable for me to get into the part of Nall, being that he's mischievous and a close friend and just seems like a likable character overall. And Ashley Angel did the voice of Alex in the first one. Originally we were going to probably ditch uh, his voice because he had grown up too much and after having heard his voice again I'm like, he doesn't age that much, you know, maybe we can use his voice because it's kind of nice because the character has grown up in the game and if his voice is a little bit older too, that's okay. I think I'm a lot like Alex. I really do. In what way? Um, 
I like to be the hero. I like to be the guy that gets the attention at the end, and I like to be the guy that saves everybody, especially Luna, you know, and she's, she's a pretty hot cartoon. It's a lot of fun, you know, being in the recording studio, doing this kind of thing, being the voice of, you know, a cartoon, basically. It's, it's acting, and it's, it's what I love to do. And then uh, Hal Delahousse does the, the voice of Quark, which is best dragon voice hands down ever. Cinema anywhere, take your pick. It's a great dragon voice. Uh, he's pitch shifted, obviously, but he has a nice rumble to his natural speaking voice so that when he talks, it's just, grr, comes right out. You are the first adventurers to visit me in a long time. A dragon is huge, and it's needed to sound huge. So by pitch shifting his voice down, and of course, usually in the most cases, the dragon's in this nice big cave, and so that lends itself to some nice big reverb, and, and uh, when we get done with it, you believe that is the dragon's voice. In the case of Nall, we pitch shifted her voice higher in order to make it sound like it was coming out of a little creature rather than out of a normal woman's voice. It also helped mask whether or not it was male or female. Alex, couldn't you hear me? I've been flying around for the last half hour looking for you. But I should have known you'd be here. Kind of more? A little more like you, you knew where he was. Alex, couldn't you hear me? I've been flying around for the last half hour calling for you. But I should have known you'd be here. One of the best things about Victor is that he doesn't write the script and then it's etched in marble, okay? It's, the product isn't finished until it's in the can. If, if we're getting there and we're looking and saying, hmm, there's not enough syllables or there's too many syllables or what's another word for, you know, how can we say this a little differently because it's not long enough, it's too, it's too long, whatever. And he's always open to, you know, to suggestions if we, you know, if we need a new word, something like that. Victor's a demanding person, and lots of times to get the line just right for him, you have got to do it 30, 40, 50 times, however many times it takes. And that we'd spend so much time on one line, so I have to hand it to him for that, for being so patient. One of the lines happened to be a screaming part, and we did that too many times for my own good. I think we had to wait a while because my voice kind of went away. We may have two, three, four takes of a particular line, and then uh, usually Victor and I will sit down and he'll listen through them and pick one or maybe two choices of a particular line. Then once those have been selected, I'll go and drop those into the game where they belong and see if we got any problems and begin lining up the dialogues and adding sound effects and maybe nipping and tucking if we're a little long, a little short, something like that to match up all the lips. They make fun of me sometimes, but it helps lighten things up so that it's not so um, serious and hard to do. So we clown around a lot. There's been times when an actor, an actress, you know, they're just, you can tell they're uptight and we need them to loosen up for something or other. So we'll play certain sound effects CDs. When he tries to make you laugh, he puts fart noises in the microphone. I haven't found a person yet who could keep a straight face during a certain set of sound effects CDs. Wishing on a dream. Uh, Jenny Steigel does the singing voice of Luna. She has a boat song in the second one that wasn't in the first game, and she does the singing for that. She also does the singing for the opening song, too. I've always, always, always wanted to sing. The boat song, more or less, is uh, talking about Luna. She's not sure where she's headed, what she's doing with her life, and she has a bunch of questions about herself, and she's um, talking about that in her song. When we originally started translating the games, I used to try and stick as closely as possible to the translated lyrics of the songs. But somewhere along the way, I figured out that that really didn't convey the emotion of the songs as well. So I decided that if I took into account the author's original intent, plus the feeling that I got from the scenes, and just rewrote the lyrics entirely, we ended up with a much better overall song, which is true in the case of Luna with the boat song, which the English version turned out to be a much more melancholy and reflective song than the Japanese one. Wishing on a dream that seems far off Hoping it will come today Into the starlit night Foolish dreamers turn their gaze Waiting on a shooting star But what if that star
pretty much control freaks on everything because we want to make sure that from start to finish the game is handled correctly and properly. By doing this deluxe packaging that we're doing, it becomes a collector's item. We have people that still have our packaging from Turbo Graphics, still have our games from Sega CD, and they keep them because it was great packaging. And with Lunar being the great game that it is and one of our personal favorites that we've done, we wanted to create packaging that the consumer wanted. We play games. We're fans ourselves. We just happen to be fans who make games. Pretty much that's the standard requirement for being an employee at Working Designs is you have to like games and you have to play the games. When I played the game, it's probably been the biggest thing of realizing, hey, we did some good work here. You know? <laughs> We're able to sit back and look at it. Each producer involved with Lunar saw at such a high level. I feel that the people who are very fond of Lunar are able to sense that fact in some way or another from the production. Everyone demanded such a high level. When it was all done, I felt such satisfaction to show everyone the finished project. It's a huge privilege to be able to be a part of that. And it's a good memory to make, something to tell my children about. I think this re-release of Lunar is going to be big. It's actually, it's, uh, it's more or less, oh my gosh, brain fart. What did you even say? Take two. Yeah, three. <laughs> All right, busy. And so, <laughs> I totally lost my thought here. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> Molesting the goddess Althena, it's all so, so exciting. He's dead based on the fact that he lost his life. Um. <laughs> Let's do that one more time, please. He's dead because he died. But that's a spoiler, don't use that. Okay, that was really good. I got a nice shirt out of the whole thing, which is kind of cool. You know, I can say, hey, you know, I was in that game. I won't have a nice car to drive or any other clothes to wear, but I'll have the shirt. You didn't hear that, did you? She was just this bodacious, pink-haired bimbo. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh... Well, that's pretty much it, actually. <laughs>